I mean, maybe one way to talk about that is people know about the Drake equation, which is a very high level, almost framework to think about what is the probability that, correct me if I'm wrong, that there's life out there uh, and intelligent life, I think. I don't know. But then you have an equation named after you now, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, I think nicely focuses in on the more um, achievable and interesting uh, part of that question, which is on whether there is habitable planets out there or how many, I guess. Right, right, habitable yeah. Planets are. So the funny thing is, was one time I met Frank Drake and I asked if he minded if I took his equation and kind of revamped it for this new field of exoplanet astronomy. He was totally cool with it. He's totally he, he cool. got total approval. Well, maybe, I, uh, I okay, so sorry. I'm not I, sure if he'd actually read the stuff about my equation, but he was cool with it. He was cool, he was cool with it. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I, I just said like 15 different things, but maybe uh, can you tell from your perspective what is the Drake equation and what is, sorry, the Seeger equation? Sure, well, the Drake equation, as you said, it's a framework. It's a description of the number of civilizations out there of intelligent beings that are able to communicate with us by radio waves. So if you think of like the mo if you think of the movie Contact, you've seen Contact, right? We're hoping to get as we're listening in actually. It's an active field of research, listening to other stars at radio wavelengths, hoping that some intelligent civilizations are sending us a message. And the Drake equation came like at the start of that whole field to put the factors down on paper to sort of illustrate what is involved to kind of estimating. And there's no real estimate or prediction of how many civilizations are out there, but it's a way to frame the question and show you each term that's involved. So I took the Drake equation and I called it a revised Drake equation. And I recast it for the search for planets by more traditional astronomy means. We're looking at stars, looking for planets, looking for rocky planets, looking for planets that are the right temperature for life, looking for planets that might have life that outputs gases that we might detect in the future. It's the same spirit of the Drake equation. It's not going to give us any magic numbers. So I'm going to say, hey, here's exactly what's out there. It's meant to kind of guide, guide of where we're going. Although the Drake equation did, I mean, the initial equation proposed actual numbers for those variables, right? Oh, yes, the and equation somehow... proposed numbers, and you can still... Put, plug your own numbers in. And there's this really cute website that lets you, for both the Drake and my revised equation, plug in some numbers and see what you get. So, yeah. So, okay. So what are, what are, I mean, what are the variables, but maybe also what are like the critical variables? So in my equation, I set out to what are the numbers of inhabited planets that show signs of life by way of gases in the atmosphere that can be attributed to life. I could just walk through the terms. That's probably sure, simpler. That so probably the first thing I say is, what are the number of stars available? And it's not that those trillions and trillions of stars everywhere. It's what are available to like a specific search. And so, for example, the MIT-led NASA mission TESS is surveying the sky, looking for all kinds of planets. But it can also, it also has stars. It has about thirty thousand red dwarf stars. So we just take a number of stars that a given survey can access. So that's what the number of stars is. Then I wanted to know what kind of stars are uh, quiet. A quiet. I called it fraction of those stars that is quiet. In the case of TESS, the way it's looking for planets is planets that transit the star. They go in front of the star as seen from the telescope. But it turns out that some stars are very active, they're variable, and they brighten and dim with time, and that interferes with our observation. I apologize to interrupt. So the transiting planet, so you're really looking for a black blob, essentially, that blocks the light. We're and, looking for a black blob that blocks the light. Mm -hmm. And then trying to say something about the size of the planet uh, from the frequency of that black blob's appearance and the size of that black blob, that kind of thing. Yeah, but let's just say that out of all the stars there are accessible to whatever telescope, some of them are just bad. For whatever reason, you're not going to be able to find planets around them. So I need to know the fraction of those that are that are good. So again, we have the number of stars, the fraction of them that we can actually find planets around. Um, and by the way, is our sun set one such? Is is our sun quiet? <laughs> our sun is quiet. Okay. <laughs> good so I have that. actually two terms. One describes how quiet they are, and one is if we can find a planet around that star. 
these transiting planets, for example, not all planets transit because the planet would have to be orbiting that star in this kind of plane mm -hmm. um, as viewed from you. But if a star is, for example, orbiting in the plane of the sky, it will never transit. It will never go in front of the star. So in that case, we have to have a fraction that takes into account of that kind of geometric factor. And hopefully, it's, I mean, you can assume that it's uniformly distributed, hopefully. Yes, we can assume, and there's evidence that it's uniformly distributed, yes. So then the next, so all of these factors so far, number of stars accessible to whatever telescope you're thinking about, how many stars are quiet, fraction of stars that are quiet, fraction that are observable, in this case, for the geometric factor. Those are all things we can measure. And there's one more term in the Seeger equation we can measure. I call it fraction of planets in the habitable zone. Because believe it or not, we have a handle on that for a certain set of stars. We know from our the Kepler Space Telescope that operated for a number of years, we have estimates for how many planets are in the so-called habitable zone of the host star for a certain type of star. So all those we have measurable. And then like the Drake equation itself, there are some terms we can not measure. And those ones, I call them FL, fraction of all those planets that have life on them because we don't know what that is. And FS, I called for spectroscopy, the fraction that have, we can use our telescope and instrument tools to look for light. Actually, FS was the ones that, the planets that, that have life that actually gives off a gas, a useful gas that might accumulate in the atmosphere so we could eventually observe it. Uh, how, how do the FL and FS interplay? So these are separate terms? Separate terms. And so, so for example, you could imagine, so for example, you could imagine life like us humans, we breathe out carbon dioxide, but our planet earth, we already have a lot of carbon dioxide on it. Well, we have hundreds of parts per million, but it has a really strong signal. So us humans breathing out carbon dioxide, it's not helpful for any intelligent beings that are looking back at earth because there's already a lot of, there's already enough carbon dioxide. We're not adding to it. So if there is life on a planet, and it's outputting a boring gas that's not helpful for us to uniquely identify as being made by life versus just being there anyway, then it's not helpful. So I separated those two terms out. Soon, I think we'll have evidence that planets that can support life, at least, are common. So, okay, uh, this is such an awesome topic. I have yeah. a million questions. Uh, what okay? I know it's a little bit of speculation, but what's your sense about that? Uh, I think FS, which is like that uh, life would produce interesting gases that would be able to detect. Like, is there one? Is there scientific evidence? And and second, is there some intuition around life producing gases, with detectable hints uh, in terms of chemistry? So interestingly enough, that entire question relates to, I'm going to say almost my life's work, yeah. the work <laughs> I'm doing now and the work I'm doing for the next 20 years. And yeah. I wish I could give you a concrete number, like 1%. Like on the worst days, it's 1%, let's say, in my mind. <laughs> you know, on the best days, it's like 80%. And yeah. I could actually go into a lot of detail here, but I'll just give you the simplest things. So first of all, we make an assumption that like us and our life here on Earth, life uses chemistry. So we use chemistry because we eat food, we breathe air, and we have metabolism that to break down food, to get energy, to store energy, and then ultimately to use it. And all life here has some kind of byproduct in, in doing all that, some kind of waste product that goes into the atmosphere. So I like to think that life everywhere uses chemistry. Some people have imagined, like, uh, let's imagine like a windmill, like mechanical energy, just getting energy and using it without storing it. And if there was life like that, it might not need to output a gas. So we make this basic assumption of chemistry. That's the first thing. The second more complicated thing that I and my team work on is what happens to the gas once it is produced by life. It goes into the atmosphere. And a lot of gas is just destroyed immediately, actually, by ultraviolet radiation or by oxygen. Oxygen is incredibly um, destructive to a lot of gases. So the gas can be produced by life, but it could be just completely destroyed by its environment. I guess it, we should pause on that that you mentioned your life's work. I mean, it, this is just a beautiful idea that uh, it's kind of paralyzing when you look out there and you wonder, is there a life out there? Uh, it's, it's the first paralyzing. 
actually before I encountered your work, I feel like an idiot, but you know, uh, it feels like there's no tool to answer that question. And then what you kind of provided is this cool idea that it might be possible to answer that by looking at the gases. I mean, that's a really interesting, it, that's a beautiful idea. And uh, yeah, so we could just pause on like, yeah, just, just, pause on that's as, as a powerful tool, I think, that uh, to build the intuition around, because I was totally clueless about it. And that was kind of, it's kind of exciting. I mean, I'm sure there's a, a folks probably early on in your life uh, who were very skeptical about this notion. Well, maybe I'm not sure, but it's it, it, generally you would want to be skeptical. It's like, well, uh, all these kinds of other things could generate gases, all, you know, all those kinds of Oh, that's of so true. And that's a big part of this growing field is how to make sure that this gas isn't produced by another effect. I but I do want to, you know, again, pausing on that and going back a bit, it's incredible to think, but like at least almost 100 years ago, there's a record of someone talking about the idea of a gas being an indicator of life elsewhere. Oh, the, that idea yes. was floating about Yes, it somewhere. was totally floating about. And it comes down to oxygen, which on our planet fills our atmosphere to 20% by volume. And, you know, we rely on oxygen to breathe. You know, when they, you hear about the people on Mount Everest running out of air, they're really running out of oxygen. Well, they're running out of oxygen because the air is getting thinner as you, they climb up the mountain. But without plants and bacteria, there's plants that, bacteria that also photosynthesizes and produces oxygen as a waste product. Without those, we would have virtually no oxygen. Our atmosphere would be devoid of oxygen. So, yeah, what, uh, if you were to analyze, uh, Earth, is oxygen the strong indicator here? Oxygen is a huge indicator. And that's what we're hoping, that there is an intelligent civilization not too far from here around a planet orbiting a nearby star with the kind of telescopes we're trying to build. And they're looking back at our sun and they've seen our Earth and they see oxygen. And they they probably won't be like 100.0% sure that there's life making it. But if they go through all the possible scenarios, they'll be left with a pretty strong hint that there's life here. <laughs> 